what's going on anyway? I'm here to talk about it. Hi, I'm Ann Headley. I'm also your host and hostess, and I use my intuition to share a story or some ideas or an anecdote about this moment now to offer guidance. This is the place where I contemplate the current moon, whether it's new or full. This time it's a full moon. And what that means for us as a pathway through daily life. I wonder about how universal themes show up for us through different seasons. And I reach for meaning to share with you, dear listener. And through this experience, I discover a richness in the utter simplicity of paying attention to life exactly as it is. So this is a full moon. It's a worm moon, a spring moon, a mud moon, a germinating moon. Last time, I contemplated fresh starts that originate in powerful washings away. And some new beginnings are not carefully planned or hoped for. And yet it's still a chance to start again and to let go and to let go and to let go. There's always that letting go. I'm thinking about how full moons can feel overly full. I always talk about this, don't I? They bring with that fullness their own kind of grief. You know that kind of sadness when you're over full? There's no more room. You've made all the choices. (laughs) I used to get this kind, this particular brand of sadness when my family, long time ago, we would go to this buffet, a hotel, what was it called? The George Washington Inn? Does that sound right? For those of you who know. And it was to me this huge, abundant, uh, extravagant display of food. There seemed to be everything, waffles and biscuits and fruit and desserts. And there I had free reign to eat just exactly what I wanted without fighting over it or pleading for seconds or even really being paid that much attention to. So I could eat what I wanted freely without that, um, what is it? I'm using my hands (laughs) to to pull this word out of the air, the the critical stare. There's a word for it. I can't find words lately. I'm really having trouble with it. Without the, um, what's the word? Darn it. Judgment. You probably know it right now. Without the judgment, the critiquing, the criticism, without the um, authoritarian eye on it. Gosh, I cannot think of that word. If you know the word, would you please send it to me, text it to me? (laughs) I know there's a word. I'm going to move on. Um, But this buffet for me was a little taste of freedom, probably like that sense of what I imagined adulthood was like, where you could have access to anything you could imagine. Anyway, that's the buffet, right? Um, And it was very different than eating at home in a family of seven, five kids. But my whole point here to talk about all this stuff is there would come a moment where I was enjoying all this freedom and I would start to be full, just absolutely, completely full. And then you know you'll be full and then a few minutes later you'll be overly full. And with that kind of fullness, there was a special grief that came about having to face the truth of limited capacity. I just couldn't eat the pudding and the pie and the mousse and the cake. I just didn't have the space as much as I wanted to and as much as I would have liked to like stuff my pockets with it and bring it home for later. And that's what I'm sensing this full moon time. We've only got this life that we've got and our capacity is limited. I just watched, read, I don't know if it was a video or just words, a post about someone who loved books and said that even if they read a book every day for the rest of their life, they still wouldn't be able to read all the books. We can't. We're not going to be able to do everything that we imagine in this lifetime. I can't be a mother of three 
and also a single woman who travels the world making documentary films and be the choreographer who emerges in her 50s and have a one-woman show at a modern art museum and be the caregiver who revolutionizes caregiver caregiving and be the animal communicator to the rich and famous and write 15 children's books and have a beautiful garden and teach my classes all over the world and finish my house and tidy to my bestest well-being my closet and be a good friend and teach surf yoga retreats and collaborate with my brother to create an art business and run year-long programming out of my studio and oh yeah this one be successful at podcasting i mean at least not all at once right do you see how i'm still even with this long list of desires i'm still not giving up on them this moon i think is saying you can only do what you do and if you need to cry about the rest of the things that's okay you can cry the moon says i'll witness that I think this full moon gives us an opportunity to confess, just like what I just did. I don't know if that's a confession, but to list out everything about your hopes and dreams and let it all come out of that backpack that you've been carrying around and take a look. You know, I often feel ashamed of my ambitions, my dreams, my desires. I feel very private about wanting so much. I want success, I want experiences, I want validation, I want recognition, and I can feel shame for wanting that so deeply. However, our dreams are just as much a kind of decorative structure as the jewelry we wear, as the artwork we choose, and somehow they need to be laid out in front of us and just observed with a keen eye. It seems important to look at them with the mind of a scientist or a poet. What is the theme here? What's the same? What's different? What can I know about myself based on these desires when I really pull them out of the dark and look at them side by side? For me, I can look at mine simply and see a theme of arts performance, public speaking, spirituality in movement in the body, group work, service, all of these help me to appreciate myself and my life more. Do you see how it's a way of seeing myself? And because I can be ashamed of my ambitions, my desires, that I will keep them locked away hoping they'll come out one day. But if I just pull them out now and lay them out, it helps me understand myself. It's a way of seeing myself instead of waiting for some future or imagined success to allow me to finally see myself. It's okay for me to look at those things now, even if they haven't come into my um, current reality, even if I can't put them on a resume, say. And this all helps me cultivate a more loving relationship with myself. Because I actually believe we now, all of us, are meant to use our wisdom to end cycles of violence. And what I know for sure is that I am so cruel to myself sometimes. I can be unkind and mean. The way I've talked to my own self sometimes is incredibly embarrassing. I've looked at my body and said, oh, Jesus, what's even happening here? And I wasn't being funny. I was offering a horrified, you should be ashamed of yourself vibe. And it's my own precious body that gives me all of these experiences and I can be so mean to myself about it. I listened to a recent episode of This American Life. It's called Heretics and it's about Reverend Carlton Pearson who was declared a heretic because he, I don't know if he heard God's voice 
I think he says God talked to him and said there really is no hell, that the only hell that exists is here on earth. And I know the Gospel of Thomas isn't widely recognized by many Christian churches, but the Gospel in the Gospel of Thomas, which is some of the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, Jesus says, heaven is spread among the earth and men do not see it. I've always loved that, that heaven is what we... Per- the way we perceive it. And that's a little bit what Reverend Carlton discovered, which is that hell is a man-made creation and that God lets everyone in to heaven. There is no afterlife of eternal damnation for anyone. And that's why he was declared a heretic. And I'm bringing that up because if you want to listen to it, And or I'm going to watch this tonight. There's a Netflix movie called Come Sunday about his story. I'm just really curious about it. I can let you know how it is if you don't feel like watching it. Of course, this is not a discussion group in that way, right? I don't give you homework. But maybe I should. I don't know. (laughs) No homework. But I would like to consider at this full moon time, what are our particular hells that we create on earth. So one of my hells is speaking unkindly to my own physical body. That's a kind of hell. And if you've had that experience, I think we all have at some point or another. It is just the worst kind of feeling to disagree with your own divinity And maybe that's part of this task right now is to lay bare all of our desires and passions and ambitions, but at the same time to discover the personal hells maybe associated with those that we participate in, that we actively participate in which kind of hell on earth, what kinds of hells do we fuel in ourselves and in others? And then if we see it, could we redirect that? Could we send our attention and our focus and our valuation into a direction of peace, harmony, heaven on earth? How can we perceive that? Could we be the humans that do perceive the heaven on earth? And if you are like me and you want ceasefire in Gaza, but you feel powerless to do anything, perhaps you can begin by enacting a ceasefire on yourself. What are the ways that you're creating internal war? And can you end that in the hopes that developing that patterning inside will also be reflected on the outside. And I know that is a very privileged position to take. But that's all I've got right now. That's my best brainstorming comes up with, oh my gosh, I want someone else to enact ceasefire, but I'm not able to do it even in the smallest ways when I'm at war with myself. What I know about my own endless, mindless, reactionary war that goes on between me and myself, it's not that easy to just stop. You know, when I know I can just get away with another jab at myself, nobody else is going to know. I don't have to confess that to anyone. How can I get accountable with my own thoughts, especially when I believe no one else will know. I'm going to read you a story that I wrote trying to make sense of my dad. There once lived a boy whose mother was broken. Instead of kisses and cuddles, she dressed up and went out to be seen by other people who also wanted to be seen. 
She wanted to better her station because everyone else did. And she didn't remember anything from her childhood but a deep, gaping pain. A big, dark hole from when her father died, shrouded in secrecy and violence. This boy was left alone long enough to let the ocean raise him. His mother sent him out in the morning, and he wasn't to return till evening. The dunes held him warm and close, and the waves encouraged his growth, his strength, while the wind showed him power, and the trees watched with pride as he grew. One day, the boy found he had grown up entirely on the outside. Inside, he still felt precisely the same. While he grew, he watched life as if it were something quite apart from himself. He tried very hard to want the things he should want, but he never loved anything as much as the sea, the sea who had raised him. When he found himself the father of a whole brood of children, he was very proud. They were bright and loving, curious and kind. But when they cried, he could hardly stay in his body. It hurt so much, he would do anything, even lash out like a frightened dog to make it stop. So he spent time away. He retreated in his mind. Eventually, he found the trees again, and he would sit with them. The trees began to mother him again. He needed so much mothering because he was given the kind of mother that gave him a deficit. She passed that hole to him. The tree's timing is slow, so it took almost his whole life to be mothered back to love by those trees. The oaks, southern yellow pine, poplar, sassafras, dogwood, magnolia, and holly. A whole mess of them, watching, holding, and loving him. The boy died one day after a good life of being loved by the earth and the beings held by her. I don't know what happened after that but his story remains. His story is hopeful. You may not get what you think you need in the form you think you need it. Don't worry about that. Put your feet on the ground and your hands too, whatever you have, and feel the pulse of the earth. Let her show you love and follow that. I picked up that story not really knowing why, but I think I know a little bit more now. I wrote that story because in all the therapy work I do and in the healing of my relationships, and I'm looking to find that place of wanting love from an authority figure. I'm always going back to sort of the father wound. And I wrote that story as a way of healing that for myself, of finding and making sense through a creative act. And I challenge you to do the same thing. Write a short story or think a short story or imagine it, dream it up. A story that fills some of those holes with love and kindness. So I want to still ask the I Ching, hey, what do you think about this full moon? And let's see what we get. Okay, so what we get is 23. Not the first time we've gotten this one. I've gotten this one a lot in my life. But today, it's unchanging. So we get hexagram 23 stripping away. What has worn out? Is there a less painful way to let this go? What is underneath the surface? I think that's part of the process that I'm thinking about if I lay out all my dreams and hopes and desires, are some of them ready to go? Some of them just are ready to go. And I don't even have to enact them anymore. They can just be gone. 
Is there a less pa- painful way to let this go? Of course, humor always gives us less painful ways to let things go. And what's underneath the surface? Is it joy? Is it actually loving being alive? The surfaces are cut and sliced away. The old and unviable is stripped back to expose the living core. This inevitable natural process often feels like a flaying. The more you have invested of yourself in these old things, the more painful it will be. It's no good at such times to imagine the future and make plans. You need to bring your energy back to the center and honor the process. This is a time to be transformed, not to act. Moreover, until the old is so utterly stripped from you that you have no choice but to think in new ways, you will only be able to recreate the old patterns. And that is not what we want to do. We would love to create new, nourishing, loving patterns for the earth, for our families, for ourselves. Stripping away is also known as deterioration, splitting apart. Strip away old ideas, eliminate what is outmoded or worn out. Also, you can see this here, first burial, stripping the corpse, site of creative transformation, and a seed figure. When you beautify things, the obligations of the old come to an end. Strip the corpse, accept this, and use the energy of stripping. This means someone who strips away the old. I'm sorry to read this part for you, but I have to. When deterioration or splitting apart or stripping away, hexagram 23, is received without changing lines, which is what we got today, it implies a situation for which there is little hope. I can barely even say that. I want to say, for which there is little hope. But don't give up hope. The little hope is that this, just like the letting go of the new moon, it's not in your control. What is let go is there are greater forces at work here. So this is not in your control either. And therefore, your interests, your particular interests, are not considered Reaffirm and support your position by being benevolent towards others. If there is a way out, it lies in a submissive attitude. And submissive in the sense that this is not a time to take big action. This is a time to process, pay attention, witness what's going on in our small circle worlds and our big circle worlds. Sometimes when I don't particularly like the hexagram we got, I will pull a card and I have this box near me. The answer is simple. This is another oracle card by Sonia Choquette. And the card that I pulled has a picture of somebody that looks sort of like on a desert island making a smoke signal and there is a big boat out in the water. And it says, thank God. I don't really love this one either, but I just, I'm not picking and choosing. I'm just receiving what I get. So I'm going to read it to you. The ego focuses on lack and therefore creates it. And just like parenthetically, I don't have any trouble. You know, the ego is not my enemy, but the ego sometimes creates such a structure for us that it can be problematic. But The ego is necessary. It holds us. It's the container for our soul. We need the ego. Sometimes the ego does a very good, strong job of holding us tightly, and we need a like softer rein with it. I'm just saying that because this this reading is saying ego and God and a lot of words I might not choose, but I'm going to read it anyway. The spirit concentrates on the endless stream of gifts God gives us and thus creates that. This is because the greatest blessing the divine bestows on us is the ability to create what we focus on. Pay attention to all that God gives you and you get more. Focus on lack and you get less. Um, uh, the secret anyone? 
Thank God throughout the day and you will be blessed with abundance. I mean, maybe Oprah said it first, right? She was the one that told us all to do the gratitude journal many, many years ago. And, and I believe in it. It's just very cliche. Okay. Offer gratitude for being alive, for the opportunities at hand, and for your challenges and the ability to find solutions. Give thanks for your health, your life, your family, and your friends. Right? Yes, I agree. Show appreciation for your blessings before they arrive. Thank your creator out loud for absolutely everything in your life because it is all a gift to you. The more you do so, the more you'll create. The ego forgets to be thankful. That's right, because it's so busy being protective. Sometimes it goes so far as to feel deprived and entitled, resentful for the lack it's actually creating. It's all so ridiculous. The ego doesn't like to be bothered with thanking God. It's too preoccupied with feeling sorry for itself. (laughs) I don't know. Does the ego really feel sorry for itself? Okay, maybe. Yeah, the, the ego is just like that anxious thing that wants us to stay here. You know, it's very, very protective. Okay, I already said that though. The ego will enjoy the benefits that come from being grateful. Tell your ego to be quiet and learn what thanking God can do. Your ego can discover how to attract flow and abundance if it joins with your spirit in giving thanks to God for everything today. (laughs) I just don't love it. I just don't love that. But I'm going to leave it in. It's so easy for me to pick and choose, but I'm going to let it stay. Thank God letting it stay as part of our reading. So we've got the deterioration. And maybe that's just the important thing to remember. As things seem to be falling apart around us, what do we have that we can be grateful for? What can we genuinely express appreciation for? And I do feel like appreciation is incredibly powerful when it's genuine, not the Thank you for whatever, you know, not the polite kind of appreciation, but the deep appreciation that comes from almost like a revelation that something is very important and valuable to you and then an expression of that into the world. And that brings us to the very end of this podcast. I had a couple other things, but I think it's for the next one. Next time we have a new moon, we're also going to be right at the edge of this solar eclipse, which is uh, just go on YouTube and listen to what everybody has to say. I'm going to do that. My hot take on this eclipse for me is I'm not going to go out of my way to watch it. (laughs) I don't know what that means. I'll find out more. I'll see why I have that feeling and I'll talk about it in the next podcast. But the next podcast is a new moon and an eclipse, and it just sounds a little dramatic to me. So we will see. All of you who are astrologers out there, what do you think? I mean, it seems like kind of a big-ish deal. So I hope you can enjoy this time. The full moon is kind of a funky time where there's extra illumination. We're seeing things we don't always see. So get your notebooks out. Write down your dreams. That's what I'm going to be doing. Okay. Until next time, may you be well and may you know peace. And may all beings be well and may all beings know peace. Thanks for listening and being here with me. You can go to my website, www.annheadley.com, to find out more about me and see what offerings I'm currently working on. You can find me at Patreon. That's www.patreon.com slash watermoonstudios. Thank you for your support and your comments, and thank you for reaching out to me when you listen. I really appreciate it. Bye for now.